Ready. <laughs> All right, this subject uh, today is, or this session is uh, uh, evangelism, power evangelism. Uh, we've been talking about Holy Spirit and fire, engaging the Holy Spirit, uh, seeing, hearing, and following what the Holy Spirit shows us and tells us and doing what God tells us. Uh, this week we had some practice with that, This uh, or last week, and then this last weekend you guys came back with testimonies of something along that line. So we want to keep fanning the fire of that and keep, uh, let's say, training our eyes to see what, what, what God is wanting to show us and tell us and respond to that. Uh, um, uh, I told about in, actually it was in 1992, about in there, I came across this book, Experiencing God by David Black. Yeah, I can put that there. Experiencing God by uh, Blackaby. Now, <laughs> truly, uh, I, I don't know if this man is Pentecostal or not. It doesn't matter. What this man taught me through that book was how to see what God is doing. And that is God's invitation for you to join him. That's why he's showing you. God is speaking to us because he knows we will speak what he's telling us. And, uh, and the thing that God shows us that is going to happen happens because we obeyed him. Now, it, it uh, uh, leaves us to this very funny question. Can God show us a vision of what is going to happen if we will not obey him? If God says this is going to happen, but you don't obey, you don't follow, then that cannot happen. So why would God show you something that's not going to happen? He doesn't. And this is what we're learning to do, is see, to receive visions, to see what God is wanting to show us, and learning how to respond and follow Him. And you learn that by practice. You learn your parents' voice by hearing and responding. Did it go good? Yes. Did it go bad? Okay, that wasn't his voice. When God speaks, I follow, and what I heard him say, I did, and oh, it was amazing. Okay, that means you're hearing correctly. Now, now, I have these books I wanted to introduce you to. Experiencing God by David Blackaby. This one actually started my journey of learning to see and hear and obey. For me, because I'd never heard of this, I'd never seen this before. I was trained to have a vision of my own, write the vision, and then begin to pray and ask God to do that. And I, I've been trained to have faith in faith in myself and that God would help me to do what I plan to do for him. And I had to relearn how to do what God shows me and man, I would see amazing fruit. And I stopped making my own plans and just started obeying him. Things became very simple, very simple. Did God say to do it? Yes, go do it. And there was amazing things. If God is not speaking to me, I stay right here. <laughs> I'm not going to waste my time. In fact, if God is not speaking, either A, I did not obey him last time, and he's still waiting for me to obey. Okay, I did obey him. Okay, so now you're in a good position. If God is not speaking, then wait. Sleep, wait. Sleep, eat, wait. Sleep, eat, wait, get rested, get ready for the next assignment. 
Huh? So when he starts speaking, you can start moving. So learn to wait. Learn to wait. To be quiet and listen and wait. Because when God speaks, it gives you the authority to go do it. And God will do what he said he would do. All right. That's this book. That's an important lesson. And this one actually comes from John 5, 19 and 20. Jesus only did what he saw and heard his father doing. John 5, 19. The whole book is based on that one verse, those two verses. <laughs> and changed the whole way I've lived my life in the last 20 plus years. Now the second book is this one, The Last Reformation. Now, I don't know how I came across this. Oh, a friend of mine found it and told me about it. And I checked it out and I went, oh my word, what is this? And he sent me this book and I read it and I was shocked. Because much of this book is actually living what this guy teaches. This guy actually goes and does it. And, uh, and I want you, so if you go on laptop, the website is called Last Reformation Pioneer School. If you go on the website, you will find this. And I've been to Bible school. I have uh, my Bachelor of Arts degree in ministry. I also have a Master's degree in ministry. And I've heard all the church history I ever care to hear. Fox's book, A Martyr, good book. And the second one is hearing this guy. He actually explains church history correctly. I've been to Bible school. I've done all the study. And I look at church history, and the way I am taught, I am confused. Why these revivals and the church destroyed? Revival and the church is destroyed, and then the church comes back. Every time there's persecution, the revival comes. This guy does a masterful job of explaining it. And in my lifetime, I have seen that this is true. It's true. And it's very simply this. I'll explain it to you. <laughs> what you'll see, this guy explains church history so beautiful. Whenever there is a move of the Holy Spirit, huh? The church grows and grows and grows. As the church grows, <coughs> it starts developing all these structures of leadership. Huh? And so you start having you know, structures of leadership. And who is under him? 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 And you have all these structures of leadership. Now these people all start fighting over this position. They all want to be number one. So it's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of rules. And the, the more revival goes on, the more rules there are until the church actually plateaus and will actually start into descent. The church will start losing power, starts losing uh, influence. What happens? Persecution comes. Uh, persecution. What happens under persecution? All of this is destroyed. There's no offices. There's no leadership. Nothing. There's nobody telling you what to do. All of these people have to listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he says. Because these people are in prison. Now what happens? The church starts to grow. As the church starts to grow, favor begins to come, things begin to happen in a good way, slowly leadership starts building to manage all of this growth. And as management comes, it begins to die off and it starts down again. This is a thing that actually slows the whole thing down. And we see it in my lifetime. I remember as a young boy, signs, wonders, miracles, casting out demons, that was normal in church. Normal in church. Some of you have maybe seen that. Now, in American church, when I was a boy, I saw that. But as church went on, 
more rules, more rules, more rules. We want a seeker-friendly church. We don't want tongues. We don't want prophecy. We don't want casting out demons in church. We don't want that. That can happen somewhere else, but not in church. And so the power, the presence of God began to subside. The church grows. It goes into tradition. And the power of God departs. This is not allowed. He's not allowed. Well, and here's the rule. Here's the rule. Let's see if I can even spell this word. I don't want to spell it. Decent. <laughs> and we want things decent and in order. That's the rule. Decent and in order. We want a nice church. We don't want all of this crazy stuff going on. People rolling on the floor. Huh? So we want decent and in order. So that means Spirit of God lifts and the church goes down. Because the Spirit of God is not allowed to move. He is not wanted. That sounds harsh. Just say it again. He is not wanted. Say it again. He is not wanted. We want you. We want you, God, to do things right. People can come and sit quiet. You can talk to their hearts. But you don't have to come and power and knock people down. We don't want that. See, and we start telling God what he can and can't do. It doesn't work like that. Huh? Okay. So this guy does a masterful job. You now me, I say it you know, in a harsh way. He says it in a nicer way. All right? <laughs> but I just want you to know, I, I watched the whole series, and I think there's like 25 one hour, one half hour. They're long, but they're very good. And I tell you this because when this school is over and you go back home, you can watch this. And it's very good. So that's why I wanted to do this for you. You can go home and do this. Now, he also speaks on the things that we're going to be talking about here shortly. So again, he can remind you of the things we're going to talk about. All right, this is a good, good, I want you to be able to get to know this thing. A lot of good information on this. Uh, I've listened to the whole thing. I ha don't have a problem with anything. So it's okay. Now, now, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, <laughs> this guy, Lonnie Frisbee. Now, Lonnie Frisbee, back in America in the 60s and 70s, young people were rebellious. They were all growing their hair long, and they're wearing clothes like it, they were Jesus. You know, long clothes, hippies. Okay, this, see how he's dressed? <laughs> they, and this one here, this is a nice picture. But you can see he's long hair. Kind of, he wants to look like Jesus, right? But anyway, these guys are hippies back then. And, and I remember the hippies. I, was a, I grew up on the farm, but the hippies lived up in the woods. They would build a fort and a house and get an old car or bus and live in that in the woods. You know, they don't know who owns the property, but they will live there until they're chased away. So... They were free people. They just lived in their cars and buses, wherever they wanted to. Now, this guy, he, he is down in California. He is, <laughs> it's a very funny story, but it's all in here. So anyway, one day he goes up in the mountains. He has no clothes on. And he's smoking that funny weed. Huh? Ooh. <laughs> huh? And he's up there and he says, God, if you're real, show yourself. God comes to him. And he's like, oh, God really comes to him. He has an encounter with God. He stops drugs, <laughs> gets his clothes on, and goes out and starts preaching. Well, he meets... Uh, one minister who has a small church, and this minister says, 
These nasty hippies, we need to do something for them. His name is Chuck. Anyway, God puts this Chuck and this pastor Chuck with his small church and this Lonnie. Well, Lonnie starts bringing all these hippies because he's praying for people and their signs and wonders and miracles are happening. Huh? And even he's taking them down to the ocean and baptizing them because that's what the Bible says. Well, as it turns out, tens of thousands of people start coming. And Chuck's church explodes and becomes a whole denomination. There's now thousands of these churches. Okay? Well, after some time, Chuck says, Ah, this Lonnie Frisbee! <laughs> He's too much chaos. <laughs> Kicks him out. So he goes out, and he's moving around preaching and praying. He's a hippie. Okay, you kick me out. Fine, I'm gone. And uh, kind of sounds like me a few minutes ago. <laughs> anyway, so he goes and he meets this other man, uh, John Wimber. Uh, John Wimber, he's a pastor. He has his church. M meets these other guys in the small home Bible study. And he comes in there, fire, fire, you know, Holy Spirit, come. And just blasts everybody. At this church begins to experience revival and thousands and thousands and thousands of people get saved and they start traveling all over the world. And they do that for a few years. And then John Wimber says, ah, this guy is too much chaos. <laughs> get out of here. But now he has a big church. So Lonnie Frisbee goes out and then he prays for this guy. He becomes a big minister. He prays for this guy. He becomes a big minister. He prays for this guy. He becomes a big minister. There's many ministries come out of this guy. But all of these guys, they go, ah, this Lonnie Frisbee is too much. <laughs> he gets getting kicked out. Okay, why does he get kicked out? And that's what these books are all about. They're really marvelous, amazing books. And then the last one makes you cry because you realize Lonnie Frisbee was an amazing man. He was free. He didn't care about anything except the presence of God. So he would move in the power of God, but when he was done preaching, maybe somehow he would do funny things over here. Maybe he had some bad behaviors. And so these ministers say, no, oh, you can't do that, so you're out. Well, what do we learn from Lonnie Frisbee? Uh, number one, God uses people. Broken people, good people, bad people. God uses people who, the amazing thing about Lonnie Frisbee is no matter what, if he was here or if he was down here, huh? it would kick him out, he's at the bottom, but even at the bottom, he'd say, God, I just want you. I just serve you. I'll just obey you, no matter what. And that's what's so amazing. And God would use him if he was doing great or if he was even doing terrible in his own life. Somehow God would continue to use him because he would just keep obeying God. Even though on his inside, he had many abuses. As a child, he was abused, abused, abused. And so as he became an adult, he also, uh, he had, his heart was not healed, and so he also abused people, not in sexual way, like when he was a child, and many people taking advantage of him. And so he really was <laughs> confused on the inside. And many people accused him of things that um, may or may not be true. But, 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 but what I, oh, Okay. So, why doesn't he just ask God to heal it then? These are some mysteries. <laughs> you know, all of us, on that answer, God has healed us in many areas of our life. Yes? God has healed us. He has changed our lives. And for all of us, we can also say, I have an area in my life that God is still working on. I'm not yet good in that field. I'm still working. God, I still want victory in that area. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we all have our weaknesses. Uh, 
and struggle. And I think God allows that sometimes because it keeps us humble. <laughs> it keeps us recognize I have no pride. I am, uh, you know, I need God's grace, his mercy. I need God to show himself faithful to me. Because that's what the world needs, is love, grace, mercy, and the faithfulness of God shown to them. I think God allows some of these things to stay in our life, to keep reminding us that <laughs> we are broken people being healed. Now, one of the things that happened is Lonnie Frisbee started a chain reaction of revival. God used him to do many things. Even though he was a very broken man, God used him to start many ministries. He actually helped John Wimber, who was down here, to go here. He's now, he, he passed away some years ago as an old man, because it's years ago, but uh, he was already ahead of a huge denomination because of Lonnie Frisbee. Now, years later, there is another church in Toronto, Canada that came up and it's called uh, Catch the Fire. Huh? Catch, 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 how do you spell catch? <laughs> catch the fire in Toronto, Canada. Now, uh, they had a big revival, and I think it was, oh, 1994. I heard about them and went to see them in 2004. That's when I discovered this. And this revival was still going on. It started in 2004, and it went until 2019. That's when they said, we're done and they changed. But, um, what, 16, 17 years, I, was, I would go there many times just to be prayed for and just to be there. It's very amazing. Now, uh, uh, many of the things that happen in Catch the Fire here in Toronto, Canada, were many things that happened to Lonnie Frisbee. But here it happened to one man, and he was doing many things. Here, everybody was doing what Lonnie Frisbee was doing. And the truth is, you can say, I am a grandson, a spiritual grandson of Lonnie Frisbee. Many of the things I do, when I look at it, I'm surprised how many things I have done in the last 18 years are the same thing as Lonnie Frisbee. I'm shocked. I never, I never met this guy or read this book until three years ago. I'm going, that's my spiritual grandfather when it comes to Holy Spirit fire. Now, why am I sharing all of this? What Lonnie Frisbee did with Holy Spirit fire, this man, <laughs> he took Lonnie Frisbee with him, and as he was moving, he was doing stuff with Lonnie, he was watching him, he was doing stuff with him, and he's learning. This guy is a professor, <sighs> what's the name of the university? Fuller Theological Seminary. This is where you get your doctorate degree level. He's a highly educated man. He teaches theology. But the things that Lonnie Frisbee was doing, he started learning and slowly started learning how to do. But where this guy was just wild and did things, this guy was, how do you do this? How, how do we do this? How would I learn to do that? And how can I teach other people to do it? So he is trying to learn these things and he 
gets them down so he can write them and put them in a book. And the one book he writes is Power Evangelism. How to go on the streets, pray for people, see miracles, and lead them to the Lord. Now, you guys, I lived during this time. And before this, I went to Pentecostal church, but I never saw signs and wonders and miracles. You know, okay, I would see that man do signs and wonders and miracles. If a man came into church, he would do the power of God, but he would take the power of God with him and go home. And it's like, oh, we need to have that man back. But what this man was just doing, John Wimber's going, how do I learn this? How can I teach others to do what this guy is doing? In the power of God. So he's writing it down, and he writes his book on power of evangelism. He sees, oh, Lonnie Frisbee goes and he prays for people. And he's so simple. He just prays for people and things happen. Well, how did you know that? Well, I could see what God was doing. Oh, he could see what God was doing. Well, why did he say, well, I can hear God speaking to me. Oh, he hears God speaking to him. And then he would do it. So, and then those things would happen. Well, then you follow up on what God's doing. So, Wimber is learning all he can from this guy. Now, <laughs> Uh, uh, now, I tell you that because if you go on the internet, you can find John Wimber, Signs and Wonders, 1985. 85? This is old. It's black and white with a little color. It's bad. But I want you to watch it because you can learn. He actually has people come up on the platform. He says, now I'm going to pray for them. God's going to heal them. Now, I want you to watch me. This is what's going to happen. And he actually trains you how to pray for people to see miracles, to see the presence of God come. And I'm going, what? You can't do that. You have to somehow go, ooh, 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 you know, God, do something here. And then it happens, and you don't know how. But now he's going, no, we're going to pray for them. Now keep your eyes open, because you're going to watch God work. Keep your eyes open. You're supposed to close them when you're praying. He says, no, you know, close your eyes and bow your head. Oh, God, oh, God. He's saying, no, keep your eyes open because you want to watch and see what God is doing. I'm going, oh. So this is an amazing thing to watch. I want you to watch it. Even I watch this many times going, and I watch it every time going, what is this? So, um, and only one time in the movie or in one of the testimonies, he shares the story of the Sunday that John uh, Lonnie Frisbee comes to his church. It's the only time he mentions his name. Now, I never knew Lonnie Frisbee. I never heard of him. But every time I watch this, <laughs> every time I would watch it, <laughs> he would say, you know, I had Lonnie Frisbee come to my church. And everybody in that room, there's like, I don't know, three, four, five hundred people, they all start laughing back in 1985. And I go, wait a minute. Everybody in that room knows who Lonnie Frisbee is. How's come I've never heard of him? So that's when I started doing the research. Now here's my point. Uh, that Sunday, Lonnie Frisbee came to his church. It was on a Mother's Day. He came and he preached a sermon. He says, okay, now we're done preaching, so let's have church. Holy Spirit, come. And the Holy Spirit fell in that church, and history started. And his church exploded. And he didn't know anything about Holy Spirit. 
And that Sunday, he began to see God do amazing things. And as he watched, he began to write down those things so that he could teach it in the university how to do signs and wonders and miracles. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, this is really excellent to watch. It, you know, I say, this guy could teach it better than I can, so why wouldn't you go there? And besides, this is three years after this guy said, Lottie Frisbee, you are too much. Go. <laughs> so all of that history is happening here. Now, uh, uh, it, it, it back in 2004, I went to Canada. And when I was there, I saw the Holy Spirit falling. There was like two, 3,000 pastors at this meeting. I saw the Holy Spirit falling, and I saw many things. I mean, people, I mean, 2,000 people may be rolling around on the floor. I, I'm, even myself, I'm rolling around on the floor. <laughs> like, oh my, what is this? I actually, I can't stand because the presence of God is so heavy there. And, uh, so in one of the sessions, uh, the, the man uh, who's pastoring here, his name is John Arnett, he says, in fact, you have, uh, there's a book here, he's reading on John Arnott's book, and there's on forgiveness, there's another one here on, on uh, signs like uh, wind, flames, fire, uh, river, symbols of the Holy Spirit. And there's a book here, it's also very good, you're reading. And, uh, uh, Anyway, John explained that when the Holy Spirit falls, he falls on people in such a way that religious people are offended at God. Offended at God. And we have to choose. Am I going to choose to be offended at what God is doing? Or do I say, God, I don't care how you're doing it. I want you. And the person who says, I, I, maybe I don't like Lonnie Frisbee, but I love what you're doing. I want you. And that person will receive. But you choose. When God falls, do you want him or will you be offended at what God does? That was the most important lesson to me. For example, today, many churches, we don't want signs and wonders and miracles. We don't want tongues and prophecy in church. Why? It will offend sinners. In fact, it even offends me when God does that. So we don't want that in the main service. We're offended at the way God does things. And so we move that out. Uh, <laughs> Lonnie Frisbee was a wild man, like him or not. And as I read, I, I read this whole series two times. The uh, first time I read it, I saw the signs and wonders miracles. The second time through, I started saying, oh, this Lonnie Frisbee, he offended a lot of people. And so you found yourself having to choose. Were you going to be offended at Lonnie Frisbee? at how he did things, or did you want the power and presence of God? If you want the power and presence of God, <laughs> you'd go listen to this guy. Because when he would preach, <clears throat> power of God would fall. It's amazing. Now, so I, I want you guys uh, to watch this. Not right now. You can do it later. But I want you to have it. When you get home, you'll say, man, Lord, what are you doing? How do I do this? Okay, just watch this. This guy too, just watch it. He actually shows you and helps you to see what God is doing. He helps train your eyes to see. It's very fascinating. Now, uh, now I have this experience. Now this is a lot of years of experience here. But then I went to India. 
Now, I have to say, I experienced these things. I experienced this in Toronto, and then I went to Africa, uh, to Sudan and Uganda. And over 40,000 people got saved. Signs and wonders and miracles happened. Why? Because of what happened here. What happened here? It was here that I learned how to engage the presence of God, learned how to more Holy Spirit, more of you, engage Him more, wait on Him, and learn to listen. And I talked about that, how to, how to quiet yourself and to listen. And, uh, and then as I move, I'm looking. Who is God talking to? What does God say? I'm always engaged with God. What, what are you saying about these people around me? Because I want to engage what God's doing. Now, God said, I'm taking you to India. I waited 18 years to go to India. Now, in 2000, what was that? 2000, 20,000, 2020. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, uh, let's just make a long story short. I, I meet up with some friends and I go to India. Now, when I'm in India, uh, we, are, uh, we get there, we're there like three days and we're locked down. We cannot move. For five months, we're locked down in a school like this with 40 other students. Now, while I'm there, I hear about this man named Kumar, who has planted 10,000 house churches. Now, I'm evangelist. I know how to grow numbers. <laughs> Not people, but numbers. You tell the numbers enough, the numbers keep growing every time you tell the story, right? So, uh, <laughs> So they said, yeah, this man has planned 10,000 house churches. I thought, okay, I know how evangelists use numbers, and even, you know, different people use numbers. So, um, you know, maybe 300, 500 churches. Okay, I, I'll go way out. The guy's planted 500 churches. Okay. And they said, no, he's planted 10,000. I said, no way, no way. He said, yeah, way. I said, if that's true, I want to meet this guy. Now, I'm an Indian, right? What? Oh, there it is. <laughs> That's very funny. Let's see. I have my little map because I've been praying for India. <laughs> so here's India. I don't know. Here's part of India here. Here's Bangladesh. And then over here, um, there's a part of India way over here. So I'm way over here. And this is where I actually meet Baswajit, locked down in this mission training school. And when I'm over here, uh, they start telling me about this uh, Kumar. And I said, no way, nobody's planted 10,000 house churches. I, I, just, I just can't go there anymore. I'm done with numbers. And uh, uh, anyway, I said, where is he in India? Because when this thing's over, I'm going to go find this guy. If it's true, I want to meet this guy. And he said, actually, he's, he's in this city. Uh, Dimapur, where we were. I said, no way. He said, yeah, way. So they arranged for a policeman to come, and we we're in lockdown, so they had a policeman come pick me up, take me through escort to where um, Kumar was. And I spent Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday uh, with this man. And he started telling me story after story after story of how many churches he's planted until I it was all became like spaghetti and oatmeal porridge in my head so many stories I just thought I can't even begin to remember these stories but under lockdown in COVID he says well let me tell you a story that's happening right now now the story had already been going on for a week and even while he's telling me, he's telling me what's happening the second week in this relevant story that's unfolding right then under COVID-19. So he says, a week ago, I went into, uh, you know, the one day he could go get food, he went to get food. When he went to get food, there's a street sweeper who is also coming to get food. Now he talked to him several times in, uh, for, about the Lord. And he knew he was a minister. So anyway, when this street sweeper, illiterate street sweeper, saw Kumar, he said, come now, come to my house. My wife is dying. 
And so he went with this man into his house. And indeed, the woman was in the bed dying. And if you've been around someone dying, you know they're dying. And, uh, and uh, so he prayed for the woman, and he, he, he said, she will live. And he left. Next morning, hot phone call. My wife got up this morning, she is cleaning the house, and she's making breakfast. Come right now to the house. So he went to the house. The house is full. The family, relatives, neighbors, they're all there. This lady was dying last night, and now she's up cooking and cleaning. How? What is this? So now, Kumar preaches the gospel to them. The story is so amazing, they respond to the gospel. This man sneaks out <laughs> of the city through all the roadblocks, out to the village, to his relatives in, in the village. Now this is the second week already. And gets out to the village and tells uh, all of his relatives in the village about the miracle that happened and how his wife is doing. But he also sees that because of COVID, they are all locked down in the village and they're all starving and there's no food and they can't get rice because government will give them a permit. Can this man do anything? So he goes back into the village and says, Kumar, can we do something? My, my family is starving. Kumar is able to go to the government and gets a permit and the government does have some wheat or, or rice and they load it up and they take it to the village. Now the village is shocked. We have been trying to get rice, and nobody cares. No government office has been willing to respond to us. But why? How did you come with this rice? So now he preaches the gospel, and he shows it. Jesus loves you. That's why this thing is happening. And you see, raising this woman, and now God is supplying your needs. Well, now the, the village says, two years ago, a man came here and started preaching the gospel, gave all of us Bibles. And we didn't want the gospel, and so we burned down the man's house and burned all the Bibles and chased the man away. And now they realize <laughs> their God didn't help. The government didn't help. This Jesus of the Bible did help. And so they returned to the gospel. Second village, same thing happened. So what just happened in a two-week period under COVID? This man's wife is raised to life. The church is planted. Family, relatives, they respond to the gospel right there. They go out to this village, shares the gospel. That village responds to the gospel. They repent for what they did to the other minister. And they all want Bibles now. The next village, same thing. So this street sweeper, <laughs> within two weeks, goes from an unbeliever to a pastor of three churches his own, and these two churches. And this man had so many of those stories, I just thought, if I'm going to remember one story, I'm going to remember this one. If I remember nothing else. Because it was so typical of his stories. Now, that leads me <laughs> to this. Now, here's actually his manual that he trained me for a week with. And we're not going to go through it all because we can't go through it all in one session. But I'm going to introduce you to it and say this thing, because here's the thing, I went back to the United States to my home church. I said, you guys, I met a man who taught me something I've never seen before in my life. And they said, stop. Uh, oh, I said, this guy's planted 10,000 house churches and his manual his training manual is four sheets of paper typed on both sides. And look, it's not even heavy. And look at that. Look at all the white space. Look at that. It's not even heavy printing. Look at that. It's even got pictures. Huh? This is, and it has seven lessons. And this is his discipleship book. I go back to the U.S. and said, you guys, you got to see this thing. And they said, stop. We got something better. 
We have a series of 26 books with six lessons in each. I tell you, it'll take you three years to go through that series of books. And I promise you, as sure as I'm standing in front of you, they will not plant one church. Because it's about learning the book. It has nothing to do with planting churches. It has to do with learning how to do things. Now you know everything. And now move on to the next subject. I grew up with it. I know this garbage. So I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. Here's something that actually works. Now, I'll just give you the highlight of this thing. <laughs> Instead of taking you through the book, I want to just give you a picture of what this looks like. It shocked me what I discovered with this guy. Number one, and we know how to do this. You guys did it this weekend. You go out on the street, you're looking for someone to pray for. Right? Lord, who do you want me to pray for? You meet the lady on the train. <laughs> Lord, I want to talk to her. Next thing you know, she's sitting right in front of you. Wow. God is at work here. All right, engage. So now, oh, God lets me talk to her. So now, what I discover is you engage, you start talking, and God will direct the conversation, and you'll talk in ways you never talked before. Is that right? Dude, I love your testimony. So, so now you get to, uh, so you share what you can, but now comes the big point. Can I pray for you? And now, fire of the Holy Spirit. That's why you pray this simple prayer. Fire of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, I just pray the fire of God to just fill you right now with the fire of his love. And <laughs> heal your wife, heal your children. You know, I pray for, you know, if they have pain, heal his leg right now in Jesus' name. So there's a power encounter of some kind. All right. Now, if God is there and there is a power encounter, let's say the guy can't walk with one leg. You pray for him, and now, oh, I haven't been able to feel my leg or walk with my leg. Oh, my word, this is amazing. So you talk, the guy is like, wow, this is amazing. You say, hey, I'll go home and have tea with you. Why not? The guy takes you home, and now in the family, he's going, look, this guy prayed for me. Look, he healed my leg. Now, you say, well, he was healed because of Jesus. Now you share your testimony of what Christ did and how he healed. And can I pray for you? So Jesus wants to do the same thing for you as he did for them. See, what, there's a power encounter, there's a presence of God there, and so now you pray for them and see what God does. And you can also respond to Jesus and uh, for them to receive Christ. Because now you share the message of salvation because of this thing. Then before you leave, simply say, I would love to come back and I'll bring my Bible with me. Yeah, come back. So you come back with the Bible. Now, <laughs> when you come back, let's say this is a guy who was healed. You come back and you say, okay, I brought you a Bible and I brought Bibles for everyone else here. You can give them. He can give those Bibles. And then, uh, let's do a Bible study. I'll show you how it works. And so you give him the guide and help him to lead the Bible study. Okay, we're going to read this. All right, now let's talk about it. What does that mean? And what do you learn about? And then there's four questions. You begin to ask and engage, and there's this conversation going. And when you're done, you pray for them and you have to come back. Now, every time you come back, this guy is, you're doing everything kind of through him. Because what are you doing? You're actually discipling this guy to be the leader because he had the power encounter. And all of these guys are believing the gospel because of who? This guy. Now here is what I learned from Kumar. I never learned anywhere else. See, it, what I learned in ministry and leadership, you know, I prayed for them. I'm here to preach a gospel, and you belong to me. And you come to my church. Or 
we even, we even take it one step down. Oh, I prayed for this guy. Okay, come to church. Is that correct? Yep. Right? When you pray for somebody and something happens, what do you do? Invite him to church. Right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Lead him to the Lord. Do what? Bring him to church. You guys, I hate to tell you this. That is a wrong answer. That is the wrong answer. Don't take him to church. Go into their house. Now let me ask you a funny question. You lead someone to the Lord, they had a power encounter, and now you bring them to church. What just happened? What just happened? You took them away from everyone else. Took them away from everybody else. And what is everybody else thinking? Where is he going? Why they take him in there? What are they teaching him? I don't like those people. He's not doing everything like he used to do in our house. What are they teaching you in there? Huh? And the truth is, we've seen it all our life. And we're at church with that one guy praying for the family, praying for the family, praying for the family for years. Is that true? Is that true? Is that true? I'm shocked. <laughs> you guys... So now what happens? You pray for this guy and you get invited into his house. Now what's happening? How did you get into that house to share the gospel? Why? How, how did you get there? The healing. Huh? The healing. Why did this guy take me to his house? Share with the family. Let me ask you a really funny question. Who is hosting the presence of God in his house? The man. Huh? The man. That man. Why would all of these people believe the gospel? Why do these people believe the gospel? Huh? Because of that man. He's the one who had the power encounter. They all know him. They don't know me. Who are you? You may be a big liar or say, selling something that's not true. Who are you? Now you're there in the house, you're talking to him, and all those people can hear what I'm saying to him. There's no secrets. It's all out in the open, and they know that what I'm telling him healed his leg. Mm -hmm. Huh? I didn't. Kumar taught me that. Nobody else. Kumar. I went to India to learn this. I was shocked. I discovered, you guys, <laughs> the worst thing about ministry, uh -huh. here we go, I'm going to give you the worst thing. Huh? My ministry. This is my ministry. Mine. These people are mine. Huh? They're mine. This is my ministry. Now all these people in this church belong to me. This, uh, this kind of thinking. Huh? <laughs> you guys. Huh? Boot. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. God wants to save these people. This is the guy that God is working on to save this family. He's the one who has brought the presence of God in. 
Now you're going to train this guy how to lead them. Because here's what's funny. When you're done talking and you leave the house and these guys have a question, who are they going to ask? Huh? Who are they going to ask? If any of these guys in his family have a question, who are they going to ask the question? The guy. Huh? The guy. That guy. Mm -hmm. You're going to say, wait a minute. What is the Bible? What, who is the Bible? What, what is this? Who is this Jesus? They're asking him like he knows everything. He says, I don't know. I just know he healed my leg. And then he goes on this phone. Mark, what's the answer? Okay, I'll come over. I'll show you. Okay, here's how you read your Bible. This is how you pray. This is where we discover things about God. Now, you're training him, and he's telling them. So you're actually equipping him to be the pastor of his own house. See how I prayed for you? You can also go pray for somebody else. See, that's the only thing they're going to learn. They're not going to learn to go to church. Mm -hmm. They're going to learn go pray for people. Mm -hmm. So you're going to actually start something new that does not exist. This is amazing. It's a different way of thinking. huh? Mm -hmm. This is really amazing. Oh my. <laughs> now... Here's something funny. I was shocked again after Kumar helped me to understand it's not about me, it's about this guy. Mm -hmm. And it's about these guys. Huh? That was real shocking to me. Wait, it's not about me. It's about him and this family. And, there's a, and, and you know what? All of his friends and family that live around him all know something's happening here are coming to this house. Mm -hmm. Really? Wow, you prayed. That guy healed you. You pray for me. And you just start praying for people. And you see the power of God show up. We can trust the Holy Spirit. I think we learn not to trust the Holy Spirit. But we can actually trust God. For, oh, my. So, and people always say, well, what if they go wild? You know what? <laughs> You know, they need to go to Bible school. They need to learn. You know what? It's because you don't trust God that you talk like that. Anybody who actually moves with signs and wonders and miracles, love this. Love this. Because they know everything they do is because of this. You cannot do signs and wonders and miracles without God. You can't. Unless you're using witchcraft and that is not signs and wonders and miracles. Mm -hmm. Do not mix the two. People say, well, demons also do that. I go, my word, really? You think demons are honoring the name of Jesus Christ? What kind of madness is that argument? Mm -hmm. That's madness to associate signs and wonders and miracles, healing people's legs as demonic. No, demons make your legs sick. You need the presence of God to set you free from that. <laughs> wow, where are we today? All right, now I want to go to the second part. Now, Kumar, he says, do you want to see my leadership training book? This is his discipleship book. Huh? Dude, four sheets of paper. Four sheets of paper. Now, I'll tell you what this thing is so loaded. This is a gold mine right here. Four sheets of paper. Now, <laughs> he says, Do you want to see my leadership training book? And I said, Kumar, don't waste your breath. Don't waste your breath. If I can't do these four sheets of paper, don't waste your breath teaching me anything more. I says, but if I actually go do this book, <laughs> I actually do this, nothing will stop me from finding you. I will come back. Oh, nothing will stop me. I'll spend thousands of dollars. 
anywhere to go in the world to find and say, okay, show me your next book, all right? So I'm telling you, I am discovering this myself, these four sheets of paper. Now, I went back to, now here, here's the lesson. Here's the lesson, you guys, that shocked me. I've been doing this for 18 years. Holy Spirit, ministry, following the Holy Spirit for 18 years. It's been the most amazing journey. What do I want to say with this? Oh, my. <laughs> so I go sit with Kumar for five days like this. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go do this. I says, when I go back to the United States, I'm going to do this. If you can do this in the United States, you can do anything. It's very hard to get into an American home. They will take you to coffee. They'll take you to a restaurant. But to get into an American home, that is an act of God. That is a sovereign miracle to get into an American home. <laughs> huh? Yeah, those doors are locked. They don't want in. Because what's the problem? If you come into their house, they don't know how to get rid of you. But if they take you to coffee, that means I'll listen to you for one hour. And then I'm leaving you in the coffee shop. I can get up and leave. Now, if they invite you to lunch or to dinner, that means two hours. Now, in two hours, they're out of there. They're done. We're going home to watch TV. Got more important things to do. So it means you got two hours if they take you out to dinner, okay? So that's an American. <laughs> there are a few exceptions. I just, they're hard to find. Let's just say they're there <laughs> for the benefit of a doubt. Now, so here's what I discovered. I'm a veteran missionary. I kind of know what I'm doing. And I'm sitting there for five days listening to this guy tell me how he planted 10,000 churches. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. I, I, I can do it. So I go back to the United States. You know how many mistakes I've made trying to do what he told me to do in a classroom? I, I, when I go back, I'm going back with Viswaja to India, and we're both going to find Kumar, and I'm going to say, Kumar, I'm going with you. Show me what you did. <laughs> I am so surprised at how hard it has been for me to learn how to do this. And it's so simple. It's unbelievable. Now, I will say, I've had some success. I, I, I've actually, I've seen some amazing things. And uh, let me just give you a story to show this actually works. I, I, I'm really surprised. I, actually, what he taught me actually works. And I'll just give you the story. May, it, it, now, if I told it already, you have to stop me. But I, I went uh, <laughs> uh, uh, six hours away from my house to the beach. We're on the beach. And I'm walking with my friend and his wife. And as we're on the beach walking, I see these guys playing football. Way out there, American football. Uh, why do they don't call it handball? Because they never kick it, you know, <laughs> seldom. No. Football is soccer, and we call ours football. We're throwing it with our hand 90% of the time. So it's a mystery to me. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. They are so far away, you cannot see their faces. You absolutely have no idea who these people are. They're way down the beach. But I see this guy just take and throw this ball. And I see the ball flying through the air, and I see this guy catch it. As soon as he catches it, the Holy Spirit says, that guy. Okay, now I'm trying to keep my eyes on the guy to make sure I don't get him lost in all the game that's going on. Like, okay, he's wearing an orange shirt. Uh, let's see, he's got shorts on, they're red, and so I'm trying to get him marked out so I can find the guy. Now, when he catches the ball, he starts running straight for me. And I'm thinking, okay, he's going to turn and start running up the field. No, he keeps coming, 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 right up to me. I'm going, wow, God, you are like, <laughs> this is wild. He runs all the way up to me. He gets there, and he sees the lady that I'm walking beside. And he says, you're my aunt. Now, so help me, he could not see that was his aunt from that distance. No way, you couldn't see faces. They were too far away. But the guy runs up there, and he says, oh, my aunt. 
So I go, okay, they're relatives. I know I can find this guy. So I don't need to get his phone number and his address and all that because I know Valerie has it. So <laughs> it's a nephew. So uh, anyway, we start talking, and, and then I just said to him, you know, uh, Christopher, uh, can I pray for you? And he said, yeah. So he calls his friends over, and I put my hand on, just fire the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And I, I just prayed some things that God told me to pray. And, and I said, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in your life that even your friends here have never known. Uh, but God knows. And right now, God is going to start redeeming all of those things that have happened in your life that even, even nobody knows. They pray this very funny prayer like that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the other guys are like, wow, pray for me too. So anyway, he had an identical brother. I prayed for him. And um, <laughs> that's why I was like, hey, this one's wearing orange shirt. This guy's wearing, you know, yellow shirt. So this is the guy because his brother is identical. You can't tell him apart. <laughs> anyway, so that's all said and done. I know now his name. The aunt knows it's this guy that I prayed for. So when he goes away, I tell Valerie, you know, all about what God just did. So she understands what's just happening here. And God just brought this guy here. So anyway, the next day, I'm on the beach, and this guy, Christopher, comes running up to me. Actually, he's in the parking lot. And he says, Mark, yesterday, when you put your hand on me, this fire went through me. He says, everything has been changing, and you got to come to my house. Huh? You guys, did you hear that? In my life, I've never had anybody do that before. This is a first. Now, Kumar goes into my head, and I go, I'd love to go to your house. I didn't say, come to church. I said, I'd love to go to your house. And as it turns out, he drives six hours back home, I drive six and a half hours past, so we're actually neighbors, not far apart. So, <laughs> really, God brought us both down here to meet, and then we just live right up here, apart from each other. So, uh, anyway, about two weeks later, I go to his apartment. I actually, he's in the university. And I get to the university, and I walk in the door, and all of his friends are there. And it's like, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're the guy who prayed for Christopher. This is, and Christopher's been praying for all of us, and all these people are coming to our room and being prayed for. Christopher's praying for all these people. What? What's going on here? So anyway, it was fun to, to pray for all of them, but this whole relationship started. But can you hear what just happened? You pray for this guy. He has a power encounter. He takes it home, and he starts activating out of his house. People are starting to come to his dorm room and to be prayed for. Start bringing, you know, Christopher, can you pray for this? How about this girl? How about this guy? You know, praying for him. The guy's got, he's praying for people. And he's calling me to say, Mark, help, what do I do? <laughs> so, well, I just want you to know, without telling more stories, I have another one. Okay, now if I tell that one, I've told all my stories. <laughs> so I'm going to save that one. So it's like, I have stories. <laughs> Two. <laughs> and I'm still learning. But you guys, I would even, and okay, I'll just simply say, even Travis, dude, I don't know how much time we have here. But I, I, I do want, I, you know what, i got to tell you the second one, because this one is, so amazing. Again, I'm at uh, Valerie and Kenneth's house. Uh, her husband, we're there, we're very good friends. And he had a, a guy's group. And as the, uh, I came in just as they were going out. And one of the young men, his name is Travis, uh, he's there. And the Holy Spirit says, pray for that one. And so I said, Travis, can I pray for you? He says, yeah. I put my hand, I said, can I pray? Uh, put my hand on you. Yes. Okay, so fire of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray for the fire of God. So that's how it always starts. And then I just prayed some things that God gave me. And, you know, just, they're like 30-second prayers, not long. And uh, so then they leave. The next day, he's coming home from work. Mark, can I come by your house? Yeah, sure. So he comes by my house, and I'm thinking, 
I want to get into his house. I don't want him to come to my house. I want to get into his house, right? I want to do this Kumar thing. And um, anyway, so, oh, all right, you can come to my house. Actually, I said, dude, I, I, I'd be glad to meet you in your house. He's like, no, no, <laughs> come to yours. I was like, oh, okay. So, uh, you know, failure. I didn't get into his house. So, uh, anyway, so he comes over to my house. And we have an amazing talk. I don't remember. We talked for an hour or two. But at the end, it says, can I pray for you? Yes. Fire, 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 the Holy Spirit. The power of God, the presence of God came down so strong in my room, my apartment. I actually am on the floor. Okay? I'm on the floor, and I'm praying for a fire. <laughs> and Travis is sitting there in his chair. Watching me. <laughs> like, dude, like... What's, what's up? And I look at him. He's just sitting there looking at me, and I'm on the floor just go, oh, Lord, Lord. Oh, you're so wonderful. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And uh, so I ask him, Travis, do you feel anything? No. No, don't feel a thing. And I'm like, how is that possible? I can't even stand. The presence of God is so strong in my room. And he's like, no. So finally, I just thought, well, I just feel silly down here on the floor. So I get up and, you know, pray for him, and he goes home. And uh, so I'm like, Lord, I don't get it. I just made a fool out of myself laying on the floor in front of this guy looking at me like, what's wrong with him? And uh, anyway, the next night in the evening, I get a phone call from his dad. His dad. I'm going, oh, he says, Mark, I'm going to come over to your house. I'm on my way. I've got to stop and see you. And I'm going, oh, man. <laughs> you know, because I happen to know their church does not believe in Holy Spirit fire, Holy Spirit anything. In fact, they had already told him no more talking about the Holy Spirit in their church. And uh, he's nice. He doesn't do stuff. So anyway... So the dad calls me and says, I got to see you. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. This guy's going to lay into me. So he comes into my house, and he says, Mark, what did you do to my son? Yesterday, when he came home, he was so different. Whatever happened, I wanted. That's how he introduced himself. And so we talked for some time. And I said, okay, well, let's just pray. Holy Spirit, come. The fire, 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 fire. Again, I'm on the floor. I, I can't even stand. I look up there at his dad <laughs> sitting on the couch. <laughs> and I'm laying down the floor. I said, don't you feel anything? He's like, no, not a thing. And I'm going, oh, man. So I get off the floor. I feel so sheepish and embarrassed. And I said, well, okay, well, God bless you. And he goes home. Three days later, I get another phone call. you got to come to our house. I want you to meet my family. And I arrange. The next Sunday, I show up and meet them in their house. Whatever this thing is, they want. Unless it turns out, right now, Travis is in South Africa as a missionary. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the father who I discover is a missionary who quit the mission field for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. But by having this power encounter, it was like God is alive. He is real. Mm -hmm. They've never felt this thing or seen anything like this before that so transformation. Their whole family just got dumped upside down. So I got invited. That's two examples where the power of God took me into their house. And the impact in their family and relationships with people. Now, I have to continue to say, like the first guy, Travis, it impacted the university where he's at, but his whole family, it affected their whole family. Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, all of them saw the impact of what God did with him. So, so uh, this is a difference of going into people's homes because of the power of God. And... And, uh, you know, I wish I had a, a better ending to this story other than the thing is still going and I'm still in a relationship with all of them. But I still got to figure out, how do you sit down and have a Bible study like this? It's like, what? <laughs> so you guys, you go do it and you tell me, you know? But I do want to say this, you guys, 
This is an absolute gold mine. I never would have known this. I would never have seen the impact of what it looks like for the man that is healed or touched by the power of God, how that influences his whole family by going into his world. And how do you go into his world? Now, I'm just telling you about this so you can understand what's in here. Uh, because if we sit down and start studying this for things and actually going through it, it will become mechanical. And you're thinking, one, two, three, four. And, and it's not like that. There is a flow to it. There's a flow. And by telling the story, it helps you to see how it flows. And so my, my failure part is when I came into Christopher's house that I didn't actually have my questions ready with the Bible to say, this is how this works. And just sit down and just do a small group study of, and let Christopher lead that study. Because that's actually what he was wanting and needing. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm excited about this whole week just to introduce you to this thing. And, uh, and you can see the impact, what it is to meet someone, pray with them, go into their house, and keep your focus on that guy, and keep their focus on that guy. Because what you're doing, what you're doing, is you're helping him to become equipped. Now, he's a baby Christian, but in this case, he is already the elder. Huh? Whether he's a boy or a man or grandpa, he is already the elder. He might be a 16-year-old kid, but if he had the miracle, he's already the elder in this group. He already knows more than all of them. That's the elder. So you're equipping him, you're training him, because this is what you're doing. Because I'm not staying. I'm not staying. I'm going to go meet somebody else to pray for them. That's why this guy has planted 10,000 house churches. The only relationship he has to all of that is him. All of that is his. It's not mine. Yeah, that's a whole other mindset. It's a mindset change. This is his. This is what God's doing with him. I only have a relationship with one guy. And if I train him, I will work with him, and then he can teach them. But I'm never going to come into his house and teach them. I'm never going to do that. Because that's being over him. That's, that's like he can't do this. I am the one. When in fact, the gospel... Let me ask you this funny question. And you're going to have theological arguments with many people who have degrees. But bless their heart, everybody is too educated in these things. So let me ask you, the woman at the well in John 4, her and Jesus had an encounter. What did she do? She ran and told everyone. What did she tell them? To come see this man. He knows everything about me. Did they believe her? Yeah. Well, they, not at first. They were curious to see Jesus himself. And then when they spent enough time with Jesus, they, they understood. No, it's not. We don't believe you. Uh, we don't believe that Jesus because of you now. We believe it because of us. Oh, uh -huh. so that's interesting. So did they believe in Jesus before they saw Jesus? No. What did they say? What did, what did you just say to me? Uh, they believe, first they believed because of her. But then when they saw him, they like, wow, well, we have even a higher... Yeah. Yeah. They believed, what? Her theological preaching or her... Witness. Witness. Her testimony. She'd been with Jesus. And you could see that. Oh my, this guy told me everything I ever did. They're going, oh no. <laughs> Oh no, what did he tell you? You know? And then they all of the city come out. So how much did she know? Nothing. Nothing. 
How qualified was she? Not at all. How much discipleship did she have? <laughs> Five seconds. <laughs> One encounter, just talking with the guy. I'll just say, I think we've made this thing too complicated. Really, four, four, four. Almost makes me angry. Maybe these two weeks I've been a lot of angry with you people. <laughs> it's like, man, I spent a lot of money in education. I hear this guy he comes up with four sheets of paper and he beat me. <laughs> this isn't fair. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, how about the demoniac? You know, where Jesus crosses the lake, he casts the demons out of that man, they all go into the pigs, run down the, the, the cliff, and then Jesus says what? The man says, I want to go with you, I want to get in the boat, I want to be your disciple, I want to follow you. Jesus says what? No. No. There's no leader on the earth is going to say that. <laughs> Boy, you come with me. We'll use you as our testimony in every one of our meetings. <laughs> you know, and, and what does the guy do? Sends him away. He goes away. And what does he do? Tells everyone else. Tells them what? <laughs> He's free. Oh, no, he, doesn't even, he didn't even have to tell anything. They just saw him. Say, who are you? You look familiar. Ah, well, I have my clothes on. That's why you didn't recognize me. You know? <laughs> am I right mind? Wow, he's just telling everybody. What was he telling them? Jesus delivered me. Jesus saved me. Look what Jesus did to me. And they're going, wow. And we see what? Two chapters later, they see Jesus coming on the boat. What happens? Everybody's ready. He's coming. He's coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus. And they just start bringing everybody who is sick and demon-possessed to Jesus. And he begins to set their free. And he spends some time there with them. And this whole region receives the gospel because of one man's testimony. So, <laughs> oh my, this is amazing. What one encounter with Jesus? Wow, it can really change everything. So, uh, education is great, but it's no substitute for the power and the presence of God. No substitute. No substitute. We need the presence of God. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be able to see, hear, and follow Him. No Bible school training can substitute that. Can't go there. But, <laughs> power of God, a little discipleship, ah, you can go a long way. So, uh, I really am excited to share this with you. This is one of the greatest treasures I've ever met. The other two great treasures I want to say that I've met is Ma Tu. Now, I, I, I want to say this fairly. I, I grew up in America, and there are so many people who have written book after book and book of apostolic ministry. What that means is you are a big man with a lot of people under you. Let's just say it like that. And how many ministries can you get gathered in under you? Under, of course, unity. But I know from studying the Bible, that's not apostolic. It's it just not apostolic. I, I, that is, I don't know what that is, but it's not what I see in the Bible. So then I meet this Amazing lady, Ma Tu. Now here is a lady nobody knows about, never heard of before, and has planted how many churches? And you can tell that woman, no, 
as many times as you want, and no matter what you tell her, you can't do that. She said, well, God said to do it. I'm going on her motorcycle. You won't send me an airplane? Fine, I'll walk. I'm getting on my motorcycle, and I'm going to go do what God told me to do. I, I, this lady <laughs> amazed me what she has done. I am so honored to have gone to Vietnam and met this lady. When I think of apostolic ministry, this is the person I think of. She's just a lady who is obedient to the Holy Spirit. She did not learn this in school. She learned it by direct download from God. She's just doing what God puts in her to do, and it just happens to be apostolic. She plants churches. She raises up leaders out of the dirt herself. This is apostolic. I'm going, oh my word, I'm not apostolic. I don't know what I am anymore after meeting her. <laughs> I'm out of taste of it. Let's put it like that. But you guys, there, and, and, then, and then she says, no, oh, there's many people like me here. Oh, what is this? Uh, truly, I, I am the most honored to have met people like this. I met them in Vietnam. You know, the other thing, there's a third person I want to talk about that has amazed me. Now, for years, I've been trying to figure out how to do missions training schools. For years, I've been studying and looking and just going, it can't be that. It can't be that. I, I love this, but it can't be that. I love this, but it can't be that. It's not what I see in the Bible. It's got to be something that Americans can't do with all the money in the world. It has to be something that is authentic by the power of God. Because everything must be by faith and by the power of God. If, 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 if people can do it with money, I don't know what it is. But it can't be the power of God. I bought it with cash. The things of God cannot be bought and bartered. <laughs> and if it takes a million dollars, that means us who don't have a million dollars can never do the work of God. See, this kind of bizarre money attached to ministry cannot be the... In fact, I don't even see it in the Bible. So what is it? So anyway, just to say, then I met the third person that has most impressed me in my life, and that's Sir Jim. This guy's planted how many missions training schools? And I thought, you know what? If I did nothing the rest of my life, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, if I was a betting man, I'd put my money on this guy. <laughs> I would not put my money in Tesla or Google or Boeing or uh, Google, whatever. No, I'm going to put my money on the things of God, the eternal, mm -hmm. and uh, it best refunds, uh, returns. So I just want to say, uh, the things that you are actually encountering in this school, just watching and seeing how things are done, you're learning that you can go to your own country and actually, within a church setting, have an apostolic prophetic training school with the power of God with even very little money. It doesn't take money. It does take the power of God. It takes the presence of God. And I've also learned, most powerfully, it's not about having 100 students. <laughs> it's not that. In fact, I'm not even interested that it would be 50 or 100. I even though I wish it was. And maybe someday it would be there. But I do know when I look in the Bible, you get that guy, you get a nation. You get that one, you'll get a, you'll get a region. You get that one, you'll get a country. It's thinking different. And here's what I know. I went to Bible school. There was 180 students in my freshman year, my first year in Bible school. Four years later, I think there's 18 
15 of us graduated from Bible school, huh? Out of 180. Really? And how many of us actually went into full time ministry and actually will retire in the ministry walking with God? I know it's less than what's on my hand. Two, three, oh no. Two. Let's hope there's five out of 180. Wow. Huh? I tell you, this stinks. This is rotten. I don't know what went wrong, but something is dead in Denmark. Or wherever. <laughs> what I saw, what I witnessed, when I went to Philippines and I met Sir June, here, here's a class of 15. Huh? They started with 15. Their first class started with 15. Didn't start with 180, it started with 15. You know how many graduated? Oh, about 15. You know how many went into ministry? 15. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What just happened? And wait a minute. Wait a minute. Something's happening here. And those guys will go, they'll start their own mission training schools, and those guys will become church planners and who knows what. But God's doing something very amazing. You guys will all go start your own mission training schools, and out of you will come church planners, out of you will become apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. See, that's okay if you got one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's about 18, 20 of them in Uganda. And what's God doing there? Oh my. Those are amazing things happening there. There's very big things happening in Uganda. That's why when I leave here, I'm going there. <laughs> so, uh, don't think this is a small school. This is a powerful school. Mm -hmm. This is a powerful school. This is a powerful school. This is very different. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let me just ask. Is there any questions, any comments you want to make? Any thoughts? Yeah. I am amazed. So, uh, that, that's what I have to share this afternoon. I want to introduce you to this. I want to introduce you uh, to these things. And I want to introduce you uh, mostly to this. When, when you go out on the street, I, I've discovered, or when you even go out anywhere, when I'm praying for people, I don't count them <laughs> anymore mm -hmm. until I get into their house. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have not achieved my purpose and my goal until I get into their house. That's what I'm after. That I'm looking for that person who will take me into their home. When I get into their house, that's when I say, I got one. Uh, I got a live wire. Now, let me just tell you just a something here. This man, Kumar, so you understand. Now, this guy also started the ministry, you know, uh, in, I think it was 2002, 2004, something like that. Same time I went to Uganda. He was, uh, he'd gotten saved. He got saved. He's, he's in India. His family uh, was Hindi, uh, Hindu. His whole family Hindu. He was Hindu, uh, but he uh, gave his life to Christ and he came into church. He's sitting in church. Uh, he's been a Christian six months. So one Sunday he's sitting in church and he looks around. He says, "If this is church, India will never get saved." Mm -hmm. And in fact, India's had the gospel for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. 
And, but he looked down and he says, if this is church, India will never get saved. And that was his last Sunday. He left. He went home and he said, Lord, there's got to be another way. And that's when he came across the Gospels and he started reading the Gospels. And he saw how Jesus, on the street, ministered to people and then he went home with them. And the impact it had being in their home. Can you think of some stories like that with Jesus? Where he prayed for somebody, somebody was healed, there was a miracle, there was an encounter, where they said, come home. Can you think of some stories? Uh, or, I'm going to go to your house. <laughs> you. Uh, the dead girl. The dead girl, he raised from the dead with the weeping mourners. Okay. Wow. He raised this girl from the dead. When they, he went into the house, he prayed for this girl, she's raised from the dead. What impact did that have on that family and community? Is that big? It's huge. And that house gets associated with that miracle. Think of another one. Ethiopian girl. Huh? Ethiopian girl on the street. The paralyzed man. Paralyzed man being lowered down from the roof. Oh! Yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, being laid lowered down into the house. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? A tax collector. Mm -hmm. Now this is where it's really funny when I watch. Anyway, let's just stay on track here. So he goes, tax collector. Everybody hates tax collectors, huh? Mm -hmm. They're not warm fuzzy people. They are. Now, you know, it's like, I don't want to be their friends. They'll find out how much money I make and wonder if I pay my taxes properly. You know, so I don't trust them. So anyway, uh, and I have a good friend who's an IRS agent. So it's like, I have a tax collector friend. <laughs> oh, anyway, and he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Love the guy, actually. He's, he's a neat man. Anyway, um, um, so Zacchaeus, uh, he invites, he says, Zacchaeus, come down, I must go to your house. So he goes to his house, and the man is so changed by what happens that he takes his money, and he says, I'm paying back anybody that I took too much taxes from. In fact, I'm going to give you five times more than what I took from you. Well, that, can you imagine the effect that had on the community? That was a huge effect. Zacchaeus had on his community. How about Lazarus? Huh? That all happened in the house. In fact, it says later when Jesus was raised, uh, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus went over to the house and the whole community came together. Because Jesus was there and Lazarus was there and they were all wanting to see Jesus, but they were also wanting to see Lazarus. Lazarus. Hey, what was it like being dead for five days or four days? Huh? What you see? <laughs> what was it like? Did you go to heaven? Did you go to hell? What, what happened? You know? <laughs> what was it like all tied up in there? I don't know. Why, why, why would you ask a guy like that? So, I mean, did you hear his voice when he shouted, Lazarus, come forth? Where were you? So, uh, it's amazing questions. I want to know. Uh, uh, but there's so many stories that happen in people's homes. Now, and so that's when he, Kumar started going, I want to pray for people. I want to get into their homes. So he started going that focus. Now let's ask this funny question. In Acts, how many things happened inside of people's homes? Can you think of some? Cornelius. Cornelius. Oh my word. Come on. Cornelius. Wow. Who else?
Jalen. Huh? In jail. In jail? Paul? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The place shakes and the jailer takes him home. Mm -hmm. His whole family is saved. Mm -hmm. And he goes back to the jail. There's amazing things happening there. What happened in the jail? Those guys had such encounter with God, even they didn't want to leave the jail. They didn't run away. Mm -hmm. And what happened in, in the jailer's house? They all got baptized that night. They didn't want to wait till morning. Mm -hmm. Really? So Kumar started seeing the impact of going into people's homes with the power of God and seeing their families affected, but even their community and even beyond. And then how even after you leave, now Paul is writing letters to the church that is in Gaius' house, a uh, church that is in so-and-so's house. Uh, there's churches in their homes. <coughs> This is amazing. And let's say, well, and I've heard this, well, people's homes can't hold very many people. Well, how many people can you get in this blue room? A hundred. <laughs> if you're in the right country, you can get a hundred in here. <laughs> you know, what about on Sunday? We went over to someone's house and they had church. They turned their living room into a sanctuary, right? They had the pulpit up there in the front, and they put all these chairs. They moved out all their living room furniture, so they put chairs in there. And if in some countries, why chairs? Just put down a mat and sit on the floor. You can get more people in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Depends on how many people are, how creative you will be. Mm -hmm. When you love people, you will do all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Oh, let's knock this wall out. We don't need that other bedroom. Let's just open up this wall so more people can be in here. You know? Things start happening. We need to buy a bigger house. <laughs> but it all happens in house. This is amazing. It's a different way to think about this. Huh? Wow. Now here's some I never thought about so just now. You know, when I was in China, I met this young guy, talked together, and he invited me to his house. I've met his whole family. I'm friends with the whole family now. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, something's happening here. So, it is kind of funny when you guys go into another country, people you meet, and the opportunities you get invited into people's homes very easily. As a, as a uh, maybe a visitor, they, it's more open. It's really amazing opportunities that God would give you. So anyway, this is what I want to talk about today. And uh, uh, <laughs> when you go out and pray for people, you're looking for God to do something in such a way that you have opportunity to go into their home Share the gospel with everyone because of what happened. Yeah? I want you to think about that. Start thinking differently. So I, I, I think of all the opportunities I've missed because I didn't know this. I didn't know. I, didn't, I just knew pray for somebody and bring them to church. If, if, and that's why we see today in church. So many times we see one saved, one saved, one saved. Because we pray for them and then we bring them out of their family into our church and the family is now upset and angry because what is happening there? They don't know. But if you went there, they would all see. And they'd all have opportunity. It's very, it looks very different. So think about that, put that in your heart, and look for those opportunities. Yeah? Okay. Any questions, comments? Is that new to you? How many of you, you would say, wow, I didn't know that? Mm -hmm. That's new? It's new? New to you? Have you heard that before? No. No. I did hear. You've heard it before? We do it in, in the Philippines. And going to their house? Yes, in their houses. 
when did you start doing that? Why didn't you share that with me? <laughs> I didn't know. Wow, good for you. Well, maybe that's why Philippines is 90% Christian, you know? Wow. Have you heard this before? Wow. This is all new to me. So I'm also experimenting, but I have found enough success that I'm amazed at what I've learned. And um, anyway, and I and honestly, I want to spend the rest of my life working on this environment and praying for people to get into their house. I mean, praying for people to see God do something to such a degree that it takes me into their house. That's that's what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to, anyway. So, Lord, thank you so much for this afternoon. I love this two hours. I, if, if, if this whole two weeks <laughs> is about learning to see and hear and obey and actually do it, it is so amazing. There's no limit to what you can do with our lives. No limit to what you can do. If we become as a child, we can enter to the kingdom of God and see you do amazing things, things we never thought were possible. Lord, even as I share what Kumar taught me, Lord, we realize just how simple and powerful the gospel actually is. Wow. Lord, open the doors Homes we open, hearts we open. Maybe we can pray like this. Lord, open my eyes to see, open my ears to hear, open my heart to obey. Open homes for the gospel to come. Open heaven over those homes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. That's my new prayer. That's my new prayer. All right. Ha, <laughs>